If I could have everyone's attention, please. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie, and today we are back with another Dun Dun Mukbang. Today I am so freaking excited because today is the only day that I have a solid bragging rights, which is the fact that a bit knew about Chapaguri before the movie even came out. That's all I gotta say about it. We'll get into it. So today we're going to be recreating the first foreign film to win the best picture at the Oscars, which is a Korean movie called Parasite. And I've actually talked about it before and like the whole plot of it, if you guys want movie spoilers, I'm gonna link that video down below, but I'm going to recreate Chapaguri, which is what they ate inside of the movie, which is a combination of two of the most iconic Korean ramen. You've got japagetti, which is an instant black bean noodle. You've got noguri, which is kind of like a like a seafoody soup noodle ramen. And then you've got a fat thing, a ribeye steak. <laughs> I'm just gonna start cutting the steak first. We're gonna cook the steak and then I'll show you guys how to combine the ramen noodles. So I'm gonna open this. This is 1.26 pounds of ribeye steak. Wow. Have you had japagetti growing up? Holy cow. No, japagetti is, is like a new thing. You yeah. know Japagiri is not a new thing. I, I looked it up. Really? Then I guess no. I've never had what? it. Wow, this one's beefy. This is my dish right here. Hello. Here's a fun fact for you. Yeah? It was created in the army. Oh, you wanna know a fun fact? You wanna know a fun fact? <laughs> you wanna know a fun fact, huh, bitch? I actually worked with Nongshi, who owns both of the ramens, and I went to a studio to eat japaguri on a TV thing that they were doing, or not a TV thing, like a little show that they were doing, and the amount of cuts, I'm pretty sure I'm still saying it wrong. What? Japaguri. Japaguri. Literally, I bet you there's an hour of footage of me somewhere. Japaguri? 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 In the movie, this is what like the kid's favorite meal is. If I cut Wait, it this way, then it'll be all flat. Oh, uh, okay, so should I just cut it into strips like here? Do you want me to do it? Yeah. I mean, I didn't give you gloves for nothing, boo-boo. I didn't give you gloves so you didn't have to do nothing. <laughs> Did you really have to come into frame the day that you're wearing that vest? Or just cut it into chunks, yes? Yeah. Okay. Hey, do you want to read them what the board says? The board says Stephanie's mukbang, bits. Okay, so this is okay, right? You need tapagetti and you need noguri. <laughs> These are the two noodles. This is actually my mom's favorite. It's spicy seafood flavor, udon type style noodles. Oh my god, that's why they call it mamdong. Okay, now I gotta fry it up. Fry it up. Welcome to my cooking show. The pan is hot, drop in even <gasps> hotter oil. That's a lot, right? That's enough. That's enough. And then you're going to grab because you're a wimp ass bitch and you're going to wow, wow. she's wow. a chef you know what I mean wow these are huge pieces honey a little bit of salt a little bit of black pepper be careful because I lost the top yeah I'll do it Okay, <laughs> so what you do now is you add in one japagetti noodle and one uh, noguri noodle, right? Noguri hana? Wait, why am I speaking? I'm getting confused. You add one noguri and one japagetti, but because I'm a m -m -m mukbanger, I'm gonna add three of each. So it's a total of six ramen. <laughs> Just the noodle and the flakes. Welcome back, we have a walk and I got six things of noodles. Like two, three minutes. Okay, now here is where you have to pay really close attention. So if you guys are just making two packs of noodles, which is the standard serving size, add in all of the japagetti sauce, which is the black bean noodle sauce, okay? So we're gonna add in all three seasonings of that one. So like the color is supposed to be kind of like a black bean noodle. Okay. And then we say some noodle water. And then we added three noguris, but if you guys just add one japagetti, one noguri, use half the seasoning of the noguri. But because we added three, we're gonna do one and a half. Why? Why not add all of it? I don't know. Maybe too salty. Oh, it is a or soup. Or spicy. It's a soup Yeah, pack. this one's a I soup see. pack. Makes sense. Can what? we get some more water though? More. 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 Let uh, me try my. Hold on. It looks so good. Is it all mixed? Is it perfect? Okay. So you have to be careful about the timing because they said if you boil it for too long, then once it gets to this point, it will get soggy. Mm. 
So you have to have it super al dente and then let it kind of heat up and cook inside of this. I act like I know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't. Did she say al dente? Al dente? You want your ramen to be al dente? <laughs> throw in the steak, mix it. And then last but not least, throw in this vegetable oil when? and then mix it. At, At the like with the steak and then you plate it with some kimchi on the side oh kimchi down below this is some oscar winning ramen right here <laughs> steak wow throw that in i got one more right here okay mix it hold on my hands are oily and that's done We'll be right back. Now, let's get to eating. Yes. I'm just gonna go in. So we've got some kimchi on the side, and this is, you guys saw us make it. Hold on. These steaks are kind of big. They cut it a lot smaller. Boobs. 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 <laughs> That's just my name now. <laughs> I meant boo-boo. I meant personally have a fear. I don't think you should use scissor on this one. Honey, it is a Korean recipe. Koreans use scissors for everything. You go to Korean barbecue, what do they do? They scissor your meat. Oh my god, this day so good. Okay, let's try. Wow. You try the steak? Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. So I read about another fun fact. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, tell me, Dad. <laughs> and this is related to the movie, so... Okay. Spoiler, I guess. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, Jabakuri it's just these two ramen, right? Instant ramen mix. But in the movie, she's trying to be, she's trying to eat this food, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be really cheap and really affordable. It's about the social class, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The so whole movie is about social class. This is not a fancy food for yeah. rich people. For her, even though she wants to taste, yeah. she's still throwing some really fancy steak. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So it's like adding steak, ribeye steak to top ramen. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. American version would be like yeah. adding ribeye steak to top ramen. Mm -hmm. Like who the hell? <laughs> and here's a deeper level. Uh -huh. uh, this one is something I read. I don't know. I don't even know if this is real or not. Two very cheap instant ramen mm -hmm. mixed with one very fancy food ingredient, which is the steak. Yeah. That kind of symbolizes the, uh, the, the house. In this house, there's three families living in this house. Oh, there is. Main family, yeah. the one underground, mm -hmm. and the rich family. Oh. So two cheap <gasps> versus one expensive. Oh my god. <laughs> it's like our house too. Me and you, the lower class, and Mango <laughs> Tiger, the higher. Oh yeah. <laughs> the higher class. That does make sense. Mm. And the rich lady has the poor lady make it for her. Mango have us make her food. <gasps> that is so true. Mm. Wow. Wow. Okay, I really hate to say this, but the ribeye tastes so good with it. Mm -hmm. It tastes so good. Yeah, I never thought steak would taste good in the seasoning. Mm. <clears throat> Holy cow. Does this taste better just than um, jabakiri? No, jabakiri? Mm. I think so. Mm -hmm. I feel like dapagetti can get a little like mundane. Yeah. I feel like if you're just I eating agree. one pack, it's delicious. But if you're ever like, oh, I need two packs to feel full, I feel like you get sick of the taste halfway through. But then once you add the doguri because it's kind of spicy, I feel like it adds more fun to it. Today I'm gonna be talking about something that is a little bit on theme. If you guys watched my parasite, you know, summary, right? Spoilers. Then you guys know that the movie itself deals with a lot of imposters. People pretending to be someone that they're not. Okay, last bit. Wow. 
Actually, mm -hmm. can I have the scissor? Mm -hmm. It's quite useful. Holy cow. There's a lot of things about imposters that confuse me. I feel like being an imposter itself confuses me. Just the idea that someone's like, okay, I'm gonna be somebody else today is kind of confusing. But I've read a lot of stories where it somewhat makes sense. Maybe, you know, you want to see how far you can get in the hospital, pretending to be a doctor. Maybe it's for money, maybe it's for this, maybe it's for that. But I guess what I don't understand is the psychology of, let's say there's somebody that you admire. Mm -hmm. Let's say you admire Billie Eilish, right? Mm -hmm. Then you could look at her and say, man, I wish I was as talented as Billie. Mm -hmm. Man, I wish I was as rich as Billie. You could say all of these things, as pretty as Billie, as this as Billie. But would you ever say, I wish I was Billie Eilish? I thought you showed me there's YouTubers. Whoa, 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 whoa. The ones that pretend to be her in public. That is dangerous. I see where that's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. But I think like in terms of just, could you ever imagine just sitting there wishing that you could have this person's entire life, that you could just exit them from it and then replace yourself into their story, into their life, into yeah. their house? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, cool, cool, cool. But I, you don't I know think what you'd you mean. still want to keep like yourself? No. <laughs> Holy cow. Well, yeah, perfectly cooked. Mmm. You think this is getting really popular because of the movie? It is? Oh, yeah. Now, this story has a big plot twist, so make sure you just stay for that part. And it all starts in Idaho, in a place called Sandpoint, Idaho. Now, when a lot of people picture an idyllic mountainside town, this would be the town. So they have this beautiful mountain on one side, and then they have one of the biggest freshwater lakes in Idaho in this little Sandpoint area. And so a lot of people go there to go fishing, to go boating, to have fun on the lake, to just do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And there's a man by the name of Paul Gruber. At the time he was in his 50s and he was a retired school teacher and he decided, you know what, I've saved up all this money. My, my, my financial advisor says, hey listen, you're not loaded. You can't go buy a mansion in mother freaking Manhattan, you know, and live off the rest of your life. But you can afford probably a decent sized home in somewhere like Sandpoint, Idaho. And he said, you know what, that's awesome because I love this place. And so he purchased his little dream home. He purchased a boat. He had a lot of personal belongings, cars, this and that. And it didn't seem like he was, you know, overexerting himself financially. It seemed that he was spending within his means. Okay. And he was living a really good life. And everyone that talked about Paul Gruber said, he is just an adventurous person. Like he's in his 50s, but he's young looking, he's fit, and he loves to go on adventures, he loves to go boating, he loves to go do this, and he loves to travel, and he retired mainly because he wanted to see the world. And so he moves into this new house, and what's very interesting is that he is a vlogger before vlogging really existed. <laughs> he videotaped everything, he was obsessed with it. But not posting online. Mm-mm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So did he really do it then? I'm just gonna... <laughs> wow. Wow. And so Paul was obsessed with videotaping everything, whether it was videotaping, you know, working on the tool area in the garage or setting up a garden in the backyard. He was obsessed with all of it. And so he videotaped all of this for his entire family to see. He would send them files or show them when he met up with them next. And so four months after moving in was the Christmas holidays. Now, I believe his daughter, Shelly, and his grandson, Josiah, 
Josiah, they didn't live in Idaho and so he made this road trip to go see them for the holidays and so he spends the Christmas holidays with them and you know Shelly remembers that something in her was feeling really off about this. Something about just this entire holiday, it just became starting to feel off. He said, you know what, I have to go back to Idaho and then I might go travel somewhere, you know, I keep you updated, it's fine, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And she was like, why don't you just stay longer, I wish you lived closer, Josiah loves hanging out with you, etc. And he said, I know, I know. And so he kissed little Josiah, he kissed Shelly and he got into his car and Pa drove away. Now Shelly at the moment, she said, this is what's interesting, is that sometimes you have these feelings. You have these feelings that this will be the last time you see somebody, but you don't really know what that means. It could be, oh, I feel like I won't see him for a while because he'll probably, may, you know, go travel a lot or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just always so hard to get in contact with him. And so she just said it was a feeling, but what can you do about this feeling? He's a grown ass adult. This is what he wants to do. And this is her dad. Yeah. And so he drives away and allegedly he ends up back in Idaho. Now this was Christmas and she hadn't heard from him since New Year. And then months had passed. February 14th, Valentine's Day comes around, and okay. she still hasn't heard from him. But again, these are fully grown adults. She has her own family started, he's traveling all the time, he's retired, and so she thought, okay, this is rude, but probably nothing crazy happened. Until Valentine's Day, she didn't receive anything. And it's been kind of like a family tradition where he always sends her flowers. Huh, okay. And so a part of her was like, okay, that's really weird. Something feels weird about this that he didn't send me flowers. But again, what can you do? How can you call the police and be like, my dad didn't send me flowers on Valentine's Day, so arrest Where's my him. Flower? <laughs> <laughs> Either arrest him or find him. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make sense. And so she's like, okay, maybe he's busy. Maybe he ended up getting a girlfriend this year. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Valentine's Day is crazy right now. And so another week passes. And this time it was Josiah's birthday. And always he writes a card or sends a present or or at least gives a phone call and nothing to the point where Josiah said can I call grandpa and left a voice message Aww. and it was really sad and she was a little bit hurt by this Shelly started getting a little bit annoyed like what the hell dad like mm -hmm. he loves you and you can't even call him I didn't mm -hmm. make up an excuse for you etc etc okay mm -hmm. but also another part of her was a little bit worried because she hadn't really spoken to him since Christmas mm -hmm. and now it's almost the end of February mm -hmm. and so you know days go by and she decides to pick up her mail from the mailbox mm -hmm. when she sees a letter from her dad and so she's like okay everything's fine right yeah. and she opens the letter and she realizes okay something feels weird because okay. her dad always made really big <laughs> I'm laughing because whatever I'm about to say really big D's so you know how some people write D's where all of the points are connecting? Yes. And then some people make a big loop with the little line hanging off the side? Yeah. He always did giant D's. So dear. Yeah, or dad, love dad, you oh. know, with a giant D. But there was none of that on this one. Okay, that's okay. weird. Okay. okay, that's just weird. Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. weird, you yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so there was none of that in this letter, and so she felt really, really off. And she said at the time that she didn't have a lot of money, you know, she was taking care of Josiah, so it's not like she could just drive, drop work, drop her kid, and just drive to Idaho and see what's up. Yeah. And so she called the police station that's closest to his house and said, hey, listen, I haven't heard from my dad in so long. This is his address. Can you guys go check up on him for me? Mm -hmm. Like a wellness check. He's you know, a little bit older, he's in his 50s, I don't know, maybe a slip and fall, I doubt it, he's athletic, but you just never know, right? Mm -hmm. And so they said, okay, that sounds good. But he wrote a letter. Mm hmm Just without a D. Without a big D. Okay, got it. Can you put this? It's so good. Wow. 
And so then, at the time that the police are checking up on him and doing a wellness check, they don't break in. They, they knock on the door. Nobody answers. They can't really do anything after that. It's a wellness check. It's not a search warrant. It's not an arrest warrant. There's no warrant. Mm -hmm. And this is his private property. That'd be highly illegal. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really do anything about it. They just let Shelly know, hey, it seems like nobody's home. I don't know if he's on vacation. I don't know if he's out at the store. We tried waiting, but nobody came home. Mm -hmm. And so she said, okay. And so she reached out to his financial advisors, which are the ones that are helping him with his retirement and making sure that he doesn't spend too much money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And she reaches out to them and they said, oh yeah, it was a little bit weird because, you know, right before he said that he was going to Canada, and she Canada. was like, Canada? And they were like, yeah, he said he was going to Canada. She's mm -hmm. like, no, he never told anyone. Anytime he travels anywhere, he always tells me and my brother. Mm -hmm. But he didn't tell either of us about Canada. Who the hell is even in Canada? Mm -hmm. And they go, well, we don't know. We thought it was weird too because we had a bond that was waiting to be, you know, over. So then we'd have to give him money. But then he was really adamant. He kept calling us about the bond. Is it almost time yet? Is it almost time to get us the money? And then all of a sudden he said, don't worry about it. I'll get it later. I'm going to Canada with some friends. Hmm. And so it just seemed very strange. And so Shelly decided to ask the police, begged and begged the police to break in. She said, listen, this is my father, the, you know, I have, I'm sur sure she had some legal ground, whether it was like, maybe she was somewhat named and, you know, you know, a level of concern. And this is a smaller town. I don't think that would fly in like New York or Los Angeles, but it was a smaller town. And so they decided, okay, so they break in. And what they found inside was a very eerie feeling. Okay. Because there was nothing inside. An empty house? There was not one thing of a personal item. All of his clothes, electronics, but what's even creepier is all of his paperwork was missing too. There was not one tax file, but sure, tax files are pretty sensitive information, documents, maybe they were taken. There wasn't even a receipt, like a sales receipt, not a text message, like a mm -hmm. sales receipt. Yeah. Shopping at CVS or at Target, there was mm -hmm. no nothing, no personal papers of any sort. They searched the entire place and something about that got the officers feeling incredibly eerie because mm -hmm. he's been living here for four or five months. He doesn't have any other places that he lives in yeah. and it's just weird. There was no furniture. There was kind of like a dining so table. So there has some stuff inside but none of them was personal. Yeah, and most of the stuff is gone. But all the personal It's like an Airbnb gone. house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot, like half of the furniture is gone. Like mm. the better furniture is gone. TV is gone. All of that's gone. All of yeah. the clothes so gone. So like an Airbnb? Yeah. It's almost <laughs> like if you, like he wasn't airbnb it or anything, but it's almost like, let's say you do have two houses. You would still keep clothes and personal items in both yeah. of them because that's the whole point of convenience of traveling yeah. between both. But there was nothing. nothing. They couldn't even find a receipt and it was driving them nuts. And what's even stranger is that he has multiple vehicles and all of them were gone. So did this guy drive each vehicle, Uber, back, drive other vehicles? It just doesn't make any sense. And so the police were concerned, but at the same time, what can they do? No crime has been committed. Yeah. At the end of the day, he's paying his mortgage, he's paying his bills, everything, like the power is not shut off, everything is still getting paid. You they don't have, oh. yeah, they don't have a warrant for his bank account statements. They don't have a warrant for any of that because hmm. he's just an adult. You can't just anytime a guy picks up and leaves for a couple days or weeks, you can't just be like arrest warrant, search yeah. warrant, his entire life, let's flip it around. And so Shelly gets a little bit frustrated and she starts begging the police to do something and they say, okay, here's what we can do. I mean, the only thing that we can do really is that you have that letter from your dad. Why don't you give it to us? We're going to send it to a specialist who specializes in handwriting, forensics, and they can kind of match and see, send us some other letters that your dad wrote you. And she said, okay, sounds good. And she sends it on over and they come back and they say, we think it's his. Huh. And so she gets increasing, increasingly frustrated because she's like, you're telling me something that I know is not true, but you don't believe me, so what can I do, right? She feels like it was a fake Yeah. Oh. But you know, the police is like, hey, if that's what they said, again, we don't have any grounds for anything. Yes, this is all suspicious. Yes, this is all weird. But at the end of the day, no crime has been committed. And so Shelly kind of, you know, keeps That's kind of interesting. Them. You what? think it was the dad? It was the dad who wrote it, it just, it was forced. Um. You know what I mean? Being kidnapped, so he's like, I'm not gonna write a big D, and then they will know. Mm -hmm. That's kind of smart. Mm -hmm. We should start writing that. Mm -hmm. Do we write to each other? <laughs> <laughs> Ever? <laughs> That's right.
Wow. And then they get a call. The police get a call and they say, hey, we found an abandoned vehicle. Come get it. Police show up. It's registered to Paul Gruber and they look into it and they realize that something about the car is a little bit off. It's the fact that it's really clean. Not just the outside, <laughs> but the inside. There Again. is no DNA. There's no fingerprints. Nothing on the inside. No personal documents. Nothing. Nothing's on the inside. And so again, this is highly suspicious. But again, there is no crime. There is no crime in abandoning your vehicle in a parking lot somewhere. Really, there's not. There's no crime in keeping the inside of your car fingerprint and DNA proof, okay? There is no crime that's been committed. And so the police at this point, they're like, first of all, Shelly is a very adamant daughter. She thinks something bad happened, and we respect her for that, and she calls us every single day and won't get, let us say no for an answer of just, no, I'm sure he's fine. And she is so, you know, passionate about this. But at the same time, maybe Paul Gruber is involved in some activities that Shelly doesn't know about. Maybe he has a girlfriend. Maybe he's involved in illegal activities. We don't know, you know? It just, all of this is incredibly suspicious, but it's not criminal activity. And so they say, okay, but what can we do? And Shelly says, please you guys are missing something I know you guys are missing something and they're like listen we already had dogs search your dad's entire house we had cadaver dogs search your dad's entire house which cadaver dogs they smell dead bodies even if they've been moved uh -huh. and they said we haven't found anything so it's just a little bit strange Mm -hmm. And so she said, please, can you please, please, please do something? And so the police officers, they decide to go back into the house and they realize something is very, very strange, which is the fact that when they first went into the house, mm -hmm. the first couple of times, there was no carpet in the dining room. Suddenly, there was carpet in the dining room. So in between search visits, someone had come into this house, this allegedly vacant house, and installed carpeting. What? Something about that is very strange. And so they let Shelly know, hey, did you, did your dad say that he was going to redo the carpeting? You know, did, maybe that's why he took out some furniture because mm -hmm. he wanted to, I don't know, work on the house, renovate it. What do you know about this? Mm -hmm. And Shelly immediately says, I know nothing about this. And when you say that there was carpeting, mm -hmm. when there wasn't before, I actually have proof that there was always carpets in the dining room. So the carpets were there, then they were removed when you guys came in, and then they were replaced. That is freaky. <laughs> and so she said, there's only one reason. There's something under the carpet. There's something under the carpet. You have to look under the carpet. What do you mean? Okay. And so they say, okay. And so they start ripping up the carpet, right? I mean, with her permission, of course. So they start ripping up the carpet and they decide for the first time to spray luminol, which catches blood. Everything starts glowing once luminol is sprayed, if there's blood on it. Yeah. And they found just large amounts of blood all underneath the carpet. Wow. And it looked like someone had cleaned it up because there's a bunch of white marks of the like wiping like this, you know, marks of the blood. So you can never really clean the blood. I heard, oh <laughs> I heard mm -hmm. <laughs> that if you, I don't know if this is true, that if you spray luminol yourself onto the blood and then clean it, apparently luminol can't test through luminol to see blood. I don't know if this is true. What is luminol? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know. I guess I have the upper hand in this relationship. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know what luminol is. <laughs> I know what luminol is. Got it. And you have life insurance. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, that gives you motive. I'm just kidding. No. I love you. They test it for blood and they spray all this luminol all over it and they find so, so much blood. And there's this one little patch of carpet that won't come up. And the police at this point, they're like, well, what's the point? We already see that there's blood. We already see that something happened here. There must be something that went wrong. Either he slipped and he fell, he injured himself, but it seems like way too much blood. So someone was killed in this room. Mm -hmm. And the head detective said, no, I want you to rip up that patch of carpet, this tiny little square of carpet. And they said, it won't come up. And they said, just do it, just do it, just do it. It had been so crazily glued onto the floor that all of them had to pull and get all of these freaking saws and shit. Finally, the carpeting was lifted and there was the tiniest little hole in the floor. Okay. Bullet hole. A bullet hole. 
Wow. And so at this point, they alert the family, and all of them were devastated. And Shelly said that this was more devastating because you have your logical side and your emotional side. Your logical side that's saying, you know, he's probably gone, Shelly. You mm -hmm. have to find closure, and you just have to focus on finding the killer. And then your emotional side that's like, but what if they find him? You know, yeah. what if they find him alive? Maybe he's in a hospital somewhere and he forgot who he is and he has amnesia from the bullet wound, you know? Yeah. Like all of these things. And so the police are like, well, at this point, we think we're looking for a body. But where could it be? It seems like the carpet was taken out. Maybe they rolled him up into a carpet. And we have one of the biggest freshwater lakes in Idaho. We've got mountains. We've got woods. Where could this body be? You know, yeah. we had the cadaver dogs search this property. It's not on the property. All the vehicles are gone. Is he, you know, in the trunk of one of his vehicles somewhere? We don't know. And so this itself, finding all of that blood in that bullet hole, gave the police department enough grounds to get a search warrant for his financial records. Mm -hmm. And so finally, they get those in, and they start realizing something weird. That during the time that he was out of contact with Shelly, he was getting a lot of ATM withdrawals. $100 here, $150 here. Very weird stuff and he was picking up his mail I mean, they had those ATM doesn't those ATM have cameras yeah and he was picking up his mail and mm -hmm. the mailbox has a camera mm -hmm. and it's a man that's not Paul Gruber oh, there you go yeah and so it's very interesting he's picking up his mail he's also writing a lot of checks to various businesses big checks five thousand dollars each three thousand dollars here and all of those businesses were owned by one local man by the name of Daryl Wow that sounds pretty stupid, no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is Daryl thinking? But, well, you'll see. Huh. Mm hmm. So good. Mm hmm. <laughs> the longest shoe. <laughs> and so they look into Daryl and they realize that this is a super sweet 42 year old church going dad of seven. And so they bring him into questioning and he was actually very cooperative. He didn't seem nervous. He didn't seem like he was committing any crimes. He was very honest and forthcoming and you know, they asked him questions. How are you even connected to Paul Gruber? How do you know Paul Gruber? And he said, well, we met, you know, I forgot where we met. I think it was in a store, he said, or something like that. And he said that he became his handyman. He was kind of down in the ruts, and Paul said, hey, look, I'm looking to renovate my entire house and work on some stuff. You want to come help me? And all of those checks were either, you know, as, like, very generous tips or for, you know, me doing a lot of work in the, around the house. And he also gave me access to his, you know, power bill. I was paying his power bill and he gave me keys to his house because he wanted me to work on certain things while he was gone. He wanted me to pay his power bill or his power bill, pick up his mail, and he went to Canada, but he should be back is what he said. What? And so they were like, huh, very interesting. And what were you doing with this money? And he was like, nothing crazy. It's not like I have like an addiction or anything like that. I'm just literally just paying bills with you know, my work, and I got paid for the work. All of this sounds very suspicious to the police. And so then finally, the police, they open up their folder, and I guess there was a lot of, like, pictures in their folder, right? And mm -hmm. of Paul Gruber, of course, because he's the one that's missing. Mm -hmm. And Daryl's looking at the picture, and the police go, okay, are you sure you haven't seen Paul anywhere? And points yep. at the picture of Paul. Mm -hmm. And you see Daryl in the interrogation tape go, that's not Paul Gruber. Mm. And the police are like, what? What do you mean? Mm -hmm. That's not Paul Gruber. 
What do you mean that's not Paul Gruber? I mean, I, I, maybe that's Paul Gruber, but that's not the Paul Gruber. The, the house that I go to, that's not that Paul. It's a different Paul. That's not the one that I pick up mail for. I've never met this man. And so the police are very intrigued by this. So they immediately bring in a specialist who does sketches. So if you have like a, you know, a suspect, they sketch up all of the things, right? Mm -hmm. And they bring them in and hours later, finally they're done and they get the sketch. And all of the police look at it and they realize, this looks like someone we know who Daryl claims to be Paul Gruber, looks like someone we know. And they all look around at each other and they go, it looks just like the sketch artist. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> he drew himself. Yeah, yeah. No, he did not drew, drew himself. Yeah, like pretty much. Why did he draw himself? Because that's how Daryl described Paul Gruber. And he drew himself? Yeah. It's very uh, confusing. That's very confusing. It's very confusing. That sounds like a narcissist. <laughs> yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> and so they go, huh, that's a little bit weird, right? Are you sure about that? Yeah. And so they decide, okay, this makes us very suspicious of... The sketch artist. They're very suspicious of Daryl. Because sketch artists are actually really good. And so Daryl can't think of a face in his head for long enough. Is that what it is? So he's subconsciously or consciously looking at the sketch artist and kind of describing someone who looks very similar to the sketch artist to the sketch artist. And sketch artist is drawing this. Sketch artist mm. is like, that does look very handsome. <laughs> what a handsome man. <laughs> and so the police immediately are like, I don't okay. know how all this thought process goes. Yeah. But okay. And so immediately the police are like, okay, we need to zone in on Daryl. And okay. so they get a search warrant and they search his entire house. And again, he was cooperative and they find a couple personal belongings of Paul Gruber's in there. But again, there was always a way to explain it away. It wasn't like he had his tax document or his electronic electronics he had like a power generator like tools so it seems like okay maybe he is just a handyman and Paul gave these to him to work on yeah and so it was very confusing but what gets even worse is that at this point even though they suspect Daryl there's nothing they can do because there's no way they can prove something happened to Paul without a body was it murder? Was it yeah. manslaughter? Was it assault? What was it? Uh -huh. And secondly, there's no way to pinpoint Daryl and the real Paul Gruber together. Because right. Daryl is denying ever meeting the real Paul Gruber. The real Paul Gruber is the one that's missing. If you can't even say they ever really met, yeah. then this is just not going to fly in court. And number three is, who the hell is the imposter? That Daryl claims that there is. Is there even an imposter? So you have so many things working around that it seemed that Daryl was going to get out scot-free. And maybe he was a little bit nervous because he picked up his entire family of seven and moved back to his hometown in Washington State. Year after year passes and day after day, Shelly is following up with the police station nonstop. She does not give it a rest. She said for two years, the TV was her babysitter because she would put her kids in front of the TV, give them food, and then be on the phone trying to find out who knows anything about where her dad is because it's been two years. Wow. All she knows is his house has been abandoned and there was blood everywhere. That's not a good way to get closure. She doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. And so she keeps calling and keeps calling. And I guess once she called, one of the police officers had picked up and they were all talking about it again. And this had been two years since the case had gone a little bit cold. Daryl had been living in Washington State for the past two years. Yes. And one of the police officers says, wait a second, are you talking about Paul Gruber? And they go, yeah. And they go, oh my God, before I became a police officer, I was a construction worker. Uh -huh. And I worked on his house with him. And they go, what? And they go, yeah, I helped build and I was like setting up electricity for him. Uh -huh. Like I know where everything in that house is. I helped build the house. Oh, wow. And so they were like, what? And so they were like, okay, let's just try one more time. Let's go, just go look one more time. Mm -hmm. And so two years later, they bring in that police officer who worked on that house physically. And he starts walking through and he goes from room to room and he goes, it doesn't look like anything's out of place. It doesn't look like there's a new wall somewhere or something got torn down. Everything looks good. And then they were like, okay, well, do you want to just check like the backyard or anything? And he was like, yeah, I mean, I guess. And so he goes down into like the little crawl space area under the house. Go under the house and at that point they had already sent the cadaver dogs in there. And so it didn't seem like, you know, the cadaver dogs probably could sniff better than a human. So they were just like, well, just for shits and giggles since we're already here. Why don't you go down to the crawl space? And so he goes down and he goes, wait a second, something's weird. 
I feel like this part didn't have this type of like soil. I don't know. It just feels weird. I could be losing my marbles. It just feels weird. Okay. Like I remember like we did all of this. I don't know. Something about this crawl space feels weird. Uh -huh. But it's only like just this one part. This one little area. And so the police are like, okay, it's probably nothing. And it's been two years. And so they start digging a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And the minute that they start digging into it, maybe they're like a foot down. Uh -huh. They said, okay, we smell it. Oh. And there's recording because they were recording all the updates and it was like 9.25 a.m. or something and they said, you know, we smell decaying flesh. We're one foot down. Oh, wow. And so they dig and they dig. I think it was like three or four feet down. And sure enough, they find Paul Gruber's body wrapped up in an air mattress to conceal the smell, I guess. Uh-huh. And what's even crazier is that he had a watch that was still ticking on his wrist wow. and he had been murdered and they couldn't pinpoint anyone to it because at the end of the day there's no way to say that Daryl actually met the real Paul Gruber nobody saw them around town together who was at the ATM machine it was Daryl yeah but how could it could be an imposter that said hey go take out some cash for me wow how can you say that Daryl met the real Paul Gruber. How can you murder someone you've never met? Doesn't seem like there was a hitman involved. Wow, so and this is still a cold case. No, not exactly. Oh, okay. Because then Shelly decided to tell all of their friends and family, like you know, like you would, that Paul was found and he had mm -hmm. been murdered. Yeah. And one of his friends said, wait a second, I have, I don't know if you want this, Shelly, but when he was visiting me, he left his um, video camera. He leaves his cameras, you know, when he travels. Oh my God. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of like cute pictures and cute videos. I don't know if it's going to hurt too much, but I mean, obviously I don't feel good keeping it. And so then she's like, okay. And so she took it and inside one of the videos, he's giving a little update on the house of the renovations. Yes. And he shows Daryl and identifies him and says, and we've got our handyman here, Daryl. Oh my And Daryl waves, and then he starts recording other parts of the house. The camera. The camera. Wow, what are all the coincidences of all of this? Mm -hmm. The cop, the camera, the right. recording, that he gave it to a friend. Mm -hmm. And didn't leave at home, bring it back, yeah. because then, you know, the friend kept it. Yes. None of the footage got deleted. And so she gave that to the police and he was arrested in Washington state and thankfully nobody tipped him off to the arrest because he actually had a go bag ready in his car. And the go bag not only had changes of clothes and food, but it had weapons with silencers on it. That's crazy. A father of seven child. Yeah. And what's even worse is that they tested the handwriting again and uh -huh. they couldn't identify that it wasn't. But they decided because recently, around that time that they found, um, you know, all of this happened, was the case of the Unabomber, and they found him because of DNA of licked stamps. Oh, okay. And so they decided to ask Shelly for the letter, and they took off the stamp where it was like yes. licked or something, and um, they tested the DNA, and it matched Daryl. And so wow. he sent the letter. And oh my so, god, I did not even think about that. You can lick a letter, and then that's DNA. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, my mom thought about it. My mom doesn't lick Thought any, about for what? Like envelopes or anything. She doesn't lick it? No. Because she doesn't want her DNA leaked? Not because her DNA. <laughs> she thinks that letter or envelopes are made in dirty factories. And I think she read somewhere that there was like parts of cockroaches. I don't know. And so okay. then what she does is she gets the water and she'll just like yeah, put her yeah. finger in the water. I think a lot of people do that. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Yeah, but mine's more for DNA purposes. Yes. I'm sure if your finger touches it, it leaves some kind of DNA. Suddenly Mink was popping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending envelopes, dipping the dog's paws in. <laughs> what happened to Daryl? I think he got life in prison. But Shelly was just saying it was very difficult because the last feeling that she had strongly was that she was really upset at him for missing her son's birthday. Mm -hmm. She almost blamed him when in reality, there's yeah. nothing he could have done about it. Yeah. Let me know in the comments, what are your thoughts on this case? How do you guys feel about this? Do you think that you would have known right off the bat that it was Daryl? What do you think about the sketch artist drawing someone that resembles the sketch artist? That's very concerning yeah. for Daryl. And let me know your thoughts. And would you guys ever eat tapa goodie? And I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.